Hello everyone, welcome to another tutorial. We are still concerned with natural language processing and it's my pleasure to basically discuss with you today our final tutorial on that topic. We have done quite a bit in the past, ses in the past sessions, starting from very basic first text classifier over a rather detailed investigation of embeddings and vertebrae in particular. And today I would like to put these things into practice. We will continue with our word embeddings. For example, we will also see some other type of techniques, but in the context of a specific application, which as you might guess from the header here is sentiment analysis. Our IMDB review data set that we introduced last time. It uh, offers a binary label for each of the 50,000 reviews, whether that review exhibits a rather a positive or an overall more positive or an overall more negative sentiment. And we will try to model this binary target variable using several techniques uh, from a very simple dictionary based approach. That will be our first sentiment analysis. Here is the stack of models that I plan for this tutorial. We start with the dictionary based approach as one baseline and then we move on to another baseline which will be a linear model based on a back of word representation where we embed words. Well, if you want to call that embed and we, we embed words by the counts. Well, I'll show you the details very soon. But of course, the focus is part number four, where we go through a stack of deep learning based approaches with embedding, without embedding, or better to say with pre-trained embeddings, without pre-trained embeddings, with fine tunings. Uh, and our last model that will be quite sophisticated, our last model for today will be a fully fledged bidirectional GRU with pre-trained Glovy embeddings. Um, well, that, that's quite a sophisticated model for sentiment and that is already. So let's get started. Um, well, one note, uh, one cautionary note maybe, if you run this uh, notebook on your own machine, some parts are quite resource intensive. You might notice that I also moved to call up for this tutorial because although my computer is actually quite okay, uh, I experienced some troubles when working, especially with, with larger pre-trained embedding matrices. And that made me using call up today. So you might wanna consider using call up or your, the, the cloud-based environment of your choice when going through this notebook. Um, I also left a couple of, of shortcuts, workarounds, comments in the code that will hopefully allow you running that on your computers to a large extent, but uh, you need to try it out. Clearly, we um, arrive at a new milestone today when it comes to computational resources. Although the data file is, is not actually not so big, uh, you will notice that certain computations really do take a little while here. But anyways, let's get started. So uh, first of all, as usual, we are importing a bunch of libraries. Basically, um, we have seen all these libraries before. I don't think there is anything new in here. So rather go over that. I well also left a little bit of code in here, anticipating many of you to use call up. I created this, this hook here, which detects whether the notebook is run in call up uh, or not. And then I would set some variables accordingly. For example, variables that tell my notebook where to find the data. Let me quickly grant access to this notebook here. Grant this notebook access to my Google Drive where I store the data. Here we go. That's a little bit annoying maybe that Whenever you run a notebook in Coolab and you want to access data stored in your Google Drive, you need to go through this authentication 
bit. Um, but of course, it's for a good reason to secure your computer and your, your data here. Right, so uh, let's have a look. Uh, first of all, we are just loading the IMDB 50K data set. That's just the data set from last week. The same data set from last week, um, just so that you convince yourself, 50,000 cases and two columns in our data frame, the review text and the binary sentiment indicator. Um, the binary sentiment indicator in the data, it's stored or it's coded as positive or negative, which some of the libraries would not like. So I binary encode my target in the next cell block. And uh, we can also observe that the target variable is actually balanced. The data is perfectly balanced. You have 25,000 positive reviews, 25,000 negative reviews. That's not very realistic. Normally, uh, whatever your target is, it will show some skew when analyzing, well, reviews, then you might expect more positives than the negatives. But uh, today we don't need to worry about the distribution of our class variable so much. All right. Um, let's, well, you know, there are different versions of our data set. If you, if you move on, then uh, you see some code here in this tutorial. We have the review text. Maybe let's have a look. Um, that's the raw data. It's not cleaned. And um, the following bits, they basically also use the clean data from tutorial number 10. Remember that we spend a little time on going through the NLP steps of cleaning the data. So uh, what I do next is basically loading the clean version of my review data set. Sorry, I missed one line. So I'm loading the cleaned review. And we have, of course, 50,000 of these. And if you compare, uh, for example, the second review in the data frame, where you still notice these HTML tags with the second review in the clean data that I was loading from disk. Well, here is the text. It's a bit hard to look at it, but you, you do see that there are no texts anymore. You may also notice that we got rid of all the stop words. I can just kill this cell. So these are my cleaned reviews. And what I basically do next is putting the cleaned reviews in my data frame so that I have all nice and clean in one central location. All the data will be living in that data frame. That is to help us keep track of where we store important data pieces. That operation, however, takes a little while. And um, OK, Collab was apparently quite quick. So um, now, basically, we have the original review data, the sentiment in binary form, and our clean review data all in one data frame. We can convince ourselves that the orientation works out, that in one row, we really matched the correct clean review to the original one. And once we convinced ourselves that the data looks good, to save some memory, we can drop the review column and then maybe create a copy of the data frame. That makes a lot of sense if you run the notebooks on your machine, because um, the again in the integration of the clean reviews in the data frame, it really takes a little while. So it's good good idea to create 
a copy of the current data frame on your disk. And in this notebook, anytime I save something to disk or I load it from disk, I continue to use Pickle. Right. Um, I do plan to run some models live. And for that reason, I will downsample the data set to only 5,000 reviews that should facilitate running at least, or at least demonstrating that you can run these models in real time. Obviously, the results will be affected. But I have pre-computed all the models uh, with the full data set, and I can share my results on Moodle if you are interested so that we can have some proper comparisons in the end, which sentiment analysis technique gave us the best results. Okay, so the data is, is all well. Uh, we reduce it a little bit. We are now left with 5,000 clean reviews. Since we randomly downsampled the data frame, and since the original data frame exhibited a balanced target variable, we would expect that now we are still left with roughly 2,500 positive and 2,500 negative reviews. And that allows us to try and predict their sentiment and then do some classification analysis. For the dictionary-based approach, we need some dictionary. And I'm using Afin. It's just one out of several dictionaries that you could draw upon here if you're if you are interested, uh, if you're very free to run a little web search for all available sentiment dictionaries, and then you can introduce some more into this notebook. And um, well, I, I would love you sharing the, the code to develop that. I'm just illustrating the whole idea. So we, we load one dictionary from Finn Arab Nielsen. And Depending on your infrastructure, you might need to install that. So I left this comment here. If you are running the code in Kohler, for example, for the very first time, you will need to install this dictionary. Otherwise, the code will not run. Right, so error. And with that bit, I should be able to execute the code. Just need to install the necessary libraries on the fly. There is no condor package available. And also I'm operating here in the Colab environment. So I install it using pip, Python package manager. And um, then we are done. Let me, let me show you how this dictionary works, right? Um, essentially, there is one function that you need to know, and it's the, the function score. So you can score some text like, what a lovely day. We score that and we get a result of three. What it does, this scoring function is very easy. It basically tokenizes the text by default using blanks, then going word by word into the dictionary and getting the sentiment score of the word out of the dictionary. And in this example, we have uh, three neutral words that don't carry a lot of sentiment. And we have the word lovely, which probably carries a rather strong positive sentiment. And then aggregating all the polarity scores of the words in the input sentence, we get a total score, which here evaluates to three. three. We can play a little bit with that. We could just uh, check what happens if I score only lovely, and indeed, uh, all the other words. What a day. They don't carry sentiment, so they do not contribute to our, our model's view on the sentiment in the input text. Or I hate working with Big data sets that crush my computer. So here I'm more negative and we get a corresponding negative score of minus three. Often scores are bounded by plus five 
very strong positive sentiment and minus five, very strong negative sentiment, and then the values that you get are anything in between. Okay, and um, well, basically what I'm now doing is I'm putting all my cleaned reviews to the scoring function, and then at the scores, the sentiment scores from my dictionary to the data frame. You know that I'm using apply here. That's that's a nice way to do it. For every line, every row in your data frame, you apply some function, namely the scoring function, and then the result, I basically just put that into a new column in my data frame. That, well, since we only use 50, no, sorry, 5,000 reviews, that was pretty quick, just taking 20 seconds. Again, if you work with a full data set, that might uh, take a little bit of time, so please be patient. And, um, well, we can now calculate the accuracy of our sentiment classifier, or maybe before doing so, let's um, have a look at some descriptives of our sentiment scores. So we have 5,000 of them, and the average, that's interesting, is um, five. And the maximum and the minimum are 115 and minus 101, respectively. And we also have the, the quartiles here. So that, that gives us an idea about the distribution of these polarity scores across all the reviews. And well, with, with 115, that must be a very, very positive review. So very, you would expect to see many strongly positive words that carry this high weight of plus five in that review. And this is how these very large scores emerge. Okay. Um, that's the overall distribution. We could also do some histograms, etc. cetera. But, um, Let's have a look at accuracy. We could um, basically, just in case we need it later, create a new variable y hat affin in our data frame, which we construct based on the um, score, which is some number within these range that we just examined. And then we can just compare that number to, let's say, we threshold at zero. And that should give us a binary variable. So the scores now are true or false, depending on whether the score is greater than zero. And then we could uh, use a little utility function here, um, part of the NumPy package, where is basically, it's, it's something like a switch. So we could say whenever this comparison evaluates to true, so when a score is greater than zero, we enter in our new column a value of one, and otherwise we enter a value of zero. And then we have our new scores here, these binary scores, and with these scores, we could use uh, some scikit-learn functionality. I was importing earlier on a function from scikit-learn to calculate classification accuracy and get out a confusion matrix. So we can often score equals accuracy score, and then for the accuracy score, we need our target, which is part of the data frame, data frame sentiment. And we also need our prediction, which we just had, it's um, y hat r fin, and that should tell us what the classification accuracy of our dictionary is. 70% accuracy. And if we believe that the 
data frame or that the label is balanced, then the naive approach of just or a random classifier would have roughly 50% accuracy. So 70% with a simple dictionary based approach, not too bad. And we could also check out in the very same manner overall, let me copy that. Trying to get some more detailed insight into our sentiment classifier by producing a confusion matrix. Let's check, here we go. In the scikit-learn implementation of the confusion matrix, we have true labels in the rows and we have predictions in the columns. So what we see here is that in the rows, we have the actually negative reviews and the actually positive reviews. Then we do notice that our sentiment classifier is a little bit biased here. We have a large number of false positive errors where the classifier believes that a review is positive, although in fact it's not positive, it's negative. And that sticks out. The false negative error is, is less, it's much less than that. Our sentiment classifier is a little bit biased, but it's just a dictionary based approach, so we would not expect that to, to really give us a very good result. But well, when, when judging the result of 70% accuracy, maybe it is a good idea to put that into context with some supposedly better models. Let's see how good we can predict that sentiment using a linear model. So um, once more relying on scikit-learn, I'm splitting my data set now into training and test so that I can evaluate my models properly. And the sentiment classifier, it did not involve any estimation uh, or any optimization. The, the sentiment scores, they are part of the dictionary. So we did not fit the sentiment classifier, the dictionary classifier to our data. And therefore we don't really have to check whether uh, we don't have to use an independent test set. But now that we start models, that is essential. And um, train test split is a function you know pretty well. I will take 25% for my test set. That's maybe not very much, but um, the code is more geared toward running it on the full review data set and then 25% is enough if you use all the 50,000 reviews. But an important question now is, since we start with the modeling, how do we input the text data for sentiment analysis based on dictionaries? There was no need to do anything. Just using the raw text or the clean text worked well. For logistic regression or for a linear classifier, we certainly need to embed our text somehow or to map it into a numeric format. And we will use a count vectorizer here. So um, let me show you some code. We, we are basically creating an object vectorizer um, of this count vectorizer class. There are many classes that offer this kind of functionality in scikit-learn, in Keras, in LT, NLTK, this time I'm using a scikit-learn function well, because I'm uh, just developing a classifier using scikit-learn, but uh, you would find the same functionality in Keras. Okay, we, we create this object, which is meant to take our raw text and produce a numeric representation of that text. And before detailing it, let me basically show you the result. Um, We fit it to our data, more specifically to our training data, which is basically just the, the cleaned reviews from my data frame. And once we, sorry about that, once we have fitted to the training data as part of the fitting, the vectorizer will split all the reviews. I did not configure it, so it will just look for blanks. 
then get all the unique words in the data using these words to build up a vocabulary. And then it can basically, for each review, just count the number of occurrences of an individual word. So, um, if we transform our data, we can basically see the result of this. Um, so, I'm taking the text data putting that to my fitted vectorizer. Well, fitting here really means that getting a vocabulary. And then since it's a, a object of class count vectorizer, the way this mapping from text to numbers is performed uses just word counts. Before well, showing that, let's do the same for our test set. And then we can test our logit model. Either I misspelled the class or I forgot to import it. Here we go again. Sorry about these little errors. Always happens when you run a code live. Okay, so um, there we are. And let's have a look at our data. We can, first of all, have a look at the shape. That's always a good idea. What does my data look like? Okay, so um, we have 3,750 cases. Well, that is not to surprise us. It's simply the number of records in the training set. So uh, that, that's okay. That makes sense. And um, what is the, the other one? 26K, 388. Our data is fairly high dimensional. And actually, that also makes sense because what this count factorizer, remember the bag of word model, it just looks for all the unique words in our data, in our corpus, if you wish, in our review corpus, more specifically the training set, because I fit my vectorizer to the training set, it looks for all the unique words in that training set, and it finds um, a bit more than 26,000 unique words. And then the, the result, the data is now for each individual review, we have all the words in our vocabulary, and the feature values, if the words are the features, the unique, unique words are the features, then their values are the occurrence counts. We can have a quick look if we just look at one instance. Take the first one. Um, well, that, that's going to be pretty big, right? So maybe. Um, well, we can first try to just have a look at the first 10 values. And then you see, oh, hold on. Uh, it's not printing out these values. And rather, we get this object description. It's a sparse matrix. Let's have a look at that. Sparse matrix with 47 stored elements in compressed form. It can be a bit more explicit and enforce this element to be printed. And then this is the result that we get, basically a list of, of indices, if you wish. So the way to read that is that in the element, in the case zero, I'm just printing out one case. For that case, at position 80, we have a feature value of one. And at position 663, we have a feature value of two. These indices correspond to words. If you wish, are, the words are indexed in our vocabulary. And here we see there are counts. And now we could, well, basically try to, to diagnose that a little bit. Um, so occurring, according to this result here, the word number 80, or with the index 80, 
is used once in the review and the word with the index 663 is used twice. We could try to, to find these words in our vocabulary. Um, well, there are a couple of, of, of methods that we could use to do that, that this object makes available to us. Um, so we have, we are concerned with X train count back and the element zero. That's try to find that element in our original training set to get the corresponding text. But um, don't be, don't be um, fooled. Since I was drawing a sample from my data frame, if I want the first element, I, I cannot use the zero as an index because the indices are affected by me sampling the data frame. Let's query the data. So you see these indices here. These are the indices. If I want that review, its index is 48,713. Uh, that is because of applying train test split. If I really want the first review in my training set, I can get that with iLock. So I really have to use iLock here. That's the first review. And we see that it starts with the word first and then view and Taylor decides. So the, the first word in that review is the word first. That's a funny coincidence. Um, and here is some code that allows me to look up, okay, what is the index of the word first in the dictionary? I had a blank in here that doesn't work out. Okay, so that's apparently the word number 8,619. And now if we are lucky, we might see that word here. Well, oh, I should remember the word. What was it? 8,619. Eight. Ah, very nice. So um, that create, gives us some comfort. So actually the word first, which is 8,619, it really occurred here in the data frame. This is just some way of, well, helping us to, to, to understand and to build trust in that type of encoding here. It's, it's a good idea to, to double check always whether after some transformation of your text data, like here where we map words to, to integer indices, whether we, we really are sure that it's the right text and we find the right words at the right positions. And that's basically what I'm trying to illustrate here, at least a little bit. Well, I'll leave some more checks in the notebook and uh, we can just rather move on. Move on with estimating our first classifier. Since we have so many dimensions, words, I'm using lasso. And um, well, there's not much to say about this code, I guess. The fact that I'm using lasso, you can notice that by the call of the logistic regression function, I set penalty to L2. That means that I'm building a lasso classifier. And this solver here, liblinear, I can use scikit-learn to interface the liblinear library, which is a very efficient library for various types of regularized linear models. This is why I'm using it. It also builds a model very quickly on the full data frame. Okay, let's check. So that model, um, that model gave us an accuracy score of 85%. So a lot better than the dictionary. I do know that we can't really compare the 70% of the dictionary to this 85% because these 85% come from the uh, test set and when doing the dictionary based analysis, we had the full data set. Although now after sampling, I could probably 
let me go back and No, it was actually it was the it was the downsample data set. Okay, yeah, but I now would I, I would now need to pick out the the test set. Uh, so what do we need to do here? We basically need to pull um, an index from The test data. And then using that index, um, we're just pulling out the test set values from our original data frame. Yeah. So um, now we have certainty, even for exactly the same tested observations, the accuracy of the dictionary based approach remains at 70%, whereas our simple logistic model or lasso model gave us uh, a much better result where we had, what was that, 85 or something. 85% accuracy. Although it's, if you think about it, it's, it's actually quite simple approach. We take all the words, no matter whether they might carry sentiment or not. In the clean data, you have to remember tutorial 10 here in the clean data, we applied stop word removal and lemmatization, but nothing, nothing else really. So all the, the words, including many words that will probably not tell anything about the sentiment are included. This is why we use Lasso to regularize the data and have inbuilt feature selection capabilities. But still, we could have done more to prepare the data. Apparently it was needed already 85%, which is not too bad. But let's move on. Deep learning. Okay, so um, we again need to ready our data for the deep learning models to come. Um, let me go through this text. Uh, no more live coding, but uh, let me give you an overview. Pretty much as with the count vectorizer, we need to build a vocabulary once again and um, in order to not let the runtimes grow too much, I define here that the deep learning models will focus only on the 25, that's very tiny. Yeah, this is the version for the sample data set. Here I'm using only 2,500 words for my vocabulary, the most popular 2,500 words. So um, that's, that's quite a simplification and it will impede the performance of my models. But I wanted to ensure that I can run some of them live and this is why I needed to do that. And then um, previously we used the count vectorizer of scikit-learn for the logit model, which implicitly also performs some token tokenization, we're making this explicit here, creating a Keras tokenizer object, telling the tokenizer that we are interested in the top 2,500 words only, and also uh, informing the tokenizer to pay attention to words, new words, not part of the vocabulary. I fit my tokenizer on the training set, so the vocabulary is with the top 2,500 words is built on the training set. And when I then use it to tokenize the reviews of the test set, it's quite likely that in the test set, some new words will appear that were not part of the training set and that my 
uh, tokenizer hasn't recognized before. And in order to ensure that these words are not dropped, otherwise they would be dropped, I'm telling this tokenizer to encode them with a value of one. And that happens here in the next call. I'm tokenizing my text, uh, or rather I'm applying the function text to sequences. That is one of these typical functions that we use to prepare data for deep learning. Um, it's something you've seen before. We map everything, every word to an integer. So my text gets tokenized. Then I have a sequence of words and the words get mapped to integers, which represent their index in the vocabulary. And then the review text basically appears like that. And then I could always ask my tokenizer object, uh, what word is stored at position 27? So basically, uh, these are the first 10 words in their integer form of my very first training set review. XTRint is my training data in integer format. And that is just a little demo here to show you how we can undo this and get back the original review. And you might recognize this text first view trailer decide series would perfect collection. That was the very same review we looked at earlier on. Uh, but maybe just to remind you, um, the original training data X train if we get out the very first element there, then this was the raw text. Our token, as it says, that review begins with 27, 295, 350. And I want to double check whether these indices are compliant with my, with my review or that if I want to verify that everything works well, I can check. Um, now I can decode these indices to words and then check whether the review that I expect to be the first review really is the one with these words. So, um, well, in a nutshell, some more bit of checking. And there is another dictionary that my tokenizer makes available that allows me to go from word to integer indices again. So I can recover the sequence that I was showing you earlier on. Last time we built these two dictionaries from word to indices and from indices to words manually in tutorial number 10. That was, that was good. It's always good to do something manual to fully understand what's going on. But this time we're doing it, well, automatically using the Keras tokenizer class that has this functionality also inbuilt. Now we have our data as integer sequences, so almost ready for deep learning. There's one thing, most layers, many layers in Keras require us to define a fixed input, well, length or input shape, let's say, to predefine the shape of our input data. In this case, I'm running this code, which uh, goes through all the reviews in the training data and calculates their length. And I find that in my training data, the longest review has 625 words. That is like a sequence with 625 time steps. You might remember that's um, quite a lot. Maybe you remember this rule of thumb where people were saying that for LSTMs, for example, um, the sequences that you input shouldn't really be longer than 400 time steps. That is a rule of thumb, but 625, that is quite a lot. And um, we might not get very good results. And also we, we might not 
train our model fast enough or why it have to wait too long. So um, as another simplification, I will just truncate the longest reviews and enforce a maximum sequence length, text length of 400 words. That's basically this bunch of code here. And um, using the function pad sequences that Keras makes available, I can then ensure that every review in my training set has exactly 400 words or tokens. The ones that have more words, they get truncated, and the reviews with less words, they get appended. The tokenizer or this function pad sequences will basically add zeros until there are exactly 400 tokens in uh, each review. And then I have a well-shaped input data structure that I can use with Keras. And then basically I'm doing the same for the test set to also prepare the, the test set for later modeling. And then here's a, the new structure of our inputs. We have uh, 3,750 reviews in the training and uh, 1,250 reviews in the test set. And the window or the sequence length of the text that we put into our neural networks is 400 due to the padding. So once we did that, we need some layers. And also I'm specifying some variables. I put that in capital letters so that um, one easily sees that this is something like a global configuration of my models. All my models will have a hidden layer size of 16 units. I will train the model for, let's say, four epochs using a batch size of 64. I will consider an embedding dimension of 50 and using 25% of the training set for validation. This also is to allow you to play around with this notebook and change the models that you build easily um, by just changing these configuration settings. So it's a pretty good idea to store variables somewhere in the code and then refer in all your, your models or parts of the code to these variables where you store configuration information that's central to your notebook, let's say. All right, first model, model number one, basic GRU. Um, here we build everything from scratch. That is, I don't know, maybe you could say a standard approach. I'm not sure that can legitimately be considered a standard approach for modern NLP. But um, it's certainly a model that, that could be considered and is consistent with what we did in the lecture, for example. Uh, let's have a look. We are building a text classifier, or we are building a model to process text. Referring to tutorial number nine, which was the first NLP tutorial, it's a very good idea to use embedding layers because the embedding layer ensures that I don't need to calculate dot products that are costly between my input vectors, my one hot input vectors, and the embedding matrix. Instead, the embedding layer implements a proper lookup. So I have my embedding matrix, the, the weights of my input boots, and then using uh, one hot encoded input boot, I pull out the right row from my embedding matrix. We discussed that in detail in tutorial number nine. That's why I use embedding layers. The input dimension is the maximum number of words in my review, which we set to 2,500. That's a nice feature of CodeUp that I can basically just uh, mouse over my variables and then see the values. That's something I am Jupyter, maybe there is an add-on that you can install, but by default, Jupyter would not allow you, would not offer you that feature, it's quite nice. 
anyways um so the number of words is sorry i was i was lost sorry the number of words 2500 is our vocabulary the top 2500 most um, common words in our review corpus because i i decided to only look at the most frequent words that's the input dimension a word comes as a one hot vector with this dimensionality my vocabulary has now size 2500 only the top 2500 most frequent words that's my vocabulary size the input is a one hot encoded vector these integer numbers in the sequences represent one hot encoded vectors that's my input dimension and the output dimension is my embedding dimension which i set to 50. again that is a bit less than what one would use in practice remember that common choices for embedding dimensions are 50 or 100 uh, sorry 100 or 300 but again that will take more runtime more time to train the model so i use only 50. that's the output of my embedding layer and input length so we need to specify how long are, is the text that we put into the embedding layer and that is our maximum review length which we set to 400 tokens and then the shape of the embedding layer is defined and we build a sequential model so this time we can use the sequential api again so the code the five carrots is concerned will be very straightforward uh, we add our embedding layer this time i'm not using lstms previously i was using lstms i'm using gru's in this tutorial gru's and lstms are rather similar recurrent neural networks lstm often performs a little bit better but uh, GRUs are easier to train. And that is why I'm using a GRU. So really, uh, you have worked with LSDMs before. Don't allow me to confuse you. It's a very, very similar type of approach, just it's faster. And today we depend on speed, at least a little bit. And this is why I'm using GRUs. One hidden, um, one GRU layer, one recurrent layer, with size 16. On, on top of that, we put a dense layer with size one. We have a binary label, so we need a single output unit. And from the GRU layer, after putting all the words and accumulating hidden state, we'll get this single output activation we use a sigmoid function here again because it's binary classification sigmoid is fine for that i don't need growth entropy sorry i don't need softmax and then i'm trained for binary cross entropy so this fits together sigmoid activation in the output layer binary cross entropy typical setup for classification binary classification problems i'm using adam fairly straightforward model quite a large number of parameters due to the embeddings 400 by 50 is our output shape sequences of length 400 with 50 features if you wish so also note that this output shape here is exactly what the GRU layer expect and what LSTM layers used to expect samples time steps features looks good and well, just train that model. Okay, so uh, shouldn't take too long. And you will notice a, a substantial speed up when running that in cool up compared to running it on your machine. Unless your machine is a lot more powerful than mine. So again, it really makes sense to run that in the cloud here, that notebook. Okay, while this model is training, um, maybe we can have a quick 
look at the the code of since this is the first model uh, but we will build many more i'm developing a little bit of infrastructure here to work with these models i'm about to build oh done let's have a look so roughly 12 seconds per epoch that's quick enough 90% accuracy on the training set, 78 validation accuracy. That's maybe a little bit worrying in that logistic regression. No, sorry. Lasso had 85% accuracy on the test set. The validation set is also holdout data. So seems we are quite apart from what logistic regression can, can give us. Anyway, so let me introduce you to these functions. Um, I basically wrote a little helper function to diagnose my models. I want functionality where I can just dump my models, the trained models, which then produces some accuracy figures and um, also do plots these typical graphs of, of the development of the training loss and the training and validation accuracy. Let's just run that code and that code. Uh, this is this helper function here. I believe it's it's well fairly well documented. We are calculating a classification accuracy, we are pulling out a confusion matrix, and we are creating a little plot when running this function. It does take a little while though. And if you if you stumble about this code, basically I'm building up a dictionary where I put all my models. So I give it a key M1, that's my first Keras model, M1. It's the key of that model. And the value in the dictionary is the result of this function, diac model, my helper function, the one I was building, where I put my model, the trained model, the, the story, which is the result of fitting the model. And because I'm calculating test set accuracy, I also need the test data and the test set labels. And then whenever I have a new model, I can just throw everything into that function, get the test loss, get the test set accuracy, 81, not too bad, almost log it level with just four epochs. Confusion matrix, okay. Um, nicely balanced. No tendency to make for more false positive or more false negative error. And we get these plots. Um, looking at which is a little bit futile with only four epochs, I'll show you some more comprehensive plots later on. And I also developed some code to store all my models so that you can later load them and um, restart your notebook if it is needed, if it crashed somewhere. And again, yeah, if you run that on your machine, it's likely that it will crash somehow, somewhere. But um, that was our first model. Let's move on. The next model I want to build is a, another GRU. But remember, the first model used the embedding layer. And all the weights in the embedding layer were initialized randomly. And then the actual embeddings they were trained together with the weights of the GRU layer. That's one way to do it. Clearly not the only way. And maybe not the most common way. By, to, by, uh, by today, it's much more common to use pre-trained embeddings. And uh, that's what we do in model two. We use pre-trained embeddings. More specifically, we will make use of the embeddings that we were training using Gensim in tutorial number 10. I created one version of Virtuvec embeddings using Gensim on the full IMDB data with an embedding dimension of 50, where I really let the model crunch these, these data for quite a while uh, hoping that our embeddings are okay for that data. And that is exactly what we did in tutorial number 10. 
I just used that code and configured it to run for more epochs and using the full data set. And you can find the resulting embeddings on Moodle in our data folder. But it's maybe worth mentioning that we once more need a little bit of infrastructure to use that. That's the first time we are working with pre-trained embeddings. So let's go through this. It's again a standardized pipeline. And once you are familiar with that pipeline, working with pre-trained embeddings will not give you uh, a hard time. First of all, I'm loading my pre-trained embeddings from disk. Apparently, this is not the, the most recent or recommended way to do it, but um, I don't want to bother with that. And maybe you recall that number, maybe not. But in tutorial number 10, we used the full data set of the IMDB reviews, the 50K review data set. And in that data set, there are roughly 85,000 unique words, roughly. You see the precise number highlighted here. For each of the words, minus the stop words, which we pulled out earlier on, for each of these words, we have an embedding. And I have now loaded that. We can peek into this variable here. I call that IMDB index, where I should be able to pull out the embedding of some word, like the word movie. Here we go. So that is the word to back representation of the word movie that we obtained from tutorial number 10. All right, so, so far so good. And I'm having, I, I was loading 85, a bit less than 85,000 of these. Now what we need to do is for the data that we now want to use for our training set in particular, we need to map everything to every word to the corresponding embedding. The Keras model will look almost exactly as it looked in model number one using this embedding layer, but this time we must not initialize the embedding layer randomly. We now want to initialize our embedding layer with the weights that come from our pre-trained embeddings. We must somehow inject these weights into the embedding layer that we are about to use. And also we must be extremely careful that we put the embedding of a word, like the word movie, that we see here in the right place in that embedding matrix. When running Keras, a review will include a word represented by its index in the vocabulary. We should be able to ask our tokenizer object um, for the index of the word movie. Which is two. And that makes a lot of sense because movie is the most frequent word in our data set and we use the um, the index one for out of vocabulary words when creating this tokenization object so it makes sense that movie has the index two that means if i'm putting a review into my into my model into my neural network the neural network will see a value of two and then it must it must pull the embedding of that word, the word movie, it will pull that from the second row of my embedding matrix. And this is what we now have to ensure manually that in this row in the embedding matrix, 
Keras will really find the right embedding, this one here, this embedding. So we need to match our pre-trained embeddings with our with the vocabulary of our downstream task, of the task that we are currently working on, sentiment analysis. Well, I've provided some explanation here. This is mainly uh, basically what I just discussed with you and look at that bit here. Most importantly, that is exactly this bit of um, how we have to be careful to create an embedding matrix that complies with our vocabulary. And I wrote the function get embedding matrix for that purpose. We put in our tokenizer object. We put in some pre-trained embedding, like the one we just loaded from disk, our IMDB embeddings. And we put in the size of our vocabulary. And then what this function does is um, it first determines from the input argument the embedding dimension. There is a little bit of checking here because I will use that function for different types of pre-trained embeddings. That's basically here just to extract the embedding dimension. Well, I know it's 50 because I choose it to be 50. I could have put a 50 here, but then my code would not be as nice. And then we are building an embedding matrix that is this EMB mat full of zeros. And we know the dimensionality of our embedding matrix. It will be the size of our vocabulary times the embedding dimension. For us, it will be 2,500 times 50. Right? Basically, what I'm doing here in this function, I'm I'm going to this dictionary word to index in my tokenizer all the items that exist. This is all the items in my vocabulary, or maybe I should say all the items in my target vocabulary, in the vocabulary of my target task. Sentiment analysis on IMDB review using only the top 2,500 words. Due to this focus on the top most frequent words, the vocabulary in tutorial number 11, in this tutorial, is already different from the vocabulary in tutorial number 10, although we are using the same data set. In the word to vec tutorial, we were training word to vec embeddings for all the words, not only the, the most frequent words. And in general, the corpus on which embeddings were pre-trained and the corpus on which you want to use these embeddings is typically different. So I'm going through all the words in my target corpus or my task or downstream corpus. And then basically I'm checking whether I would find the current word somewhere in that dictionary of pre-trained embeddings, pre-trained dot word. So I'm indexing the embeddings I just loaded from disk with the current word and check whether I find it. In many cases, I will find it. In some cases, I won't find it. I'm using try catch here, um, which results in, yeah, it's good to read in what, what, what's the effect here. My embedding matrix is all zeros for start. We initialize that right here to np.0 of the right dimension. So it's all zeros. And then we are going through our corpus, our target corpus, word by word. For each word, we check whether in the pre-trained embeddings we find that word, whether a, a good embedding for that word has been pre-trained, and if yes, we put the pre-trained weights into our embedding matrix. And if no, well, this call will raise an error 
But using try catch, I can catch this error so that my code does not crash. And instead, the except blot will be executed. Well, I just keep track of the word that I, I couldn't find. And I maintain a list OOV out of vocabulary words for all the words that exist in my target corpus, but have no embedding in the matrix of or in the dictionary of my pre-trained embeddings. That's basically how this works. And because I'm using my tokenizer and using word to index, and then these index that comes out of it, the I here, I use that to index my embedding matrix and this this combo here. This combo will ensure that when we, for example, look for the word movie and find an embedding in our pre-trained embedding dictionaries, or among our pre-trained embedding, let's say, we find the word movie, we will then input the weights, the embedding weights corresponding to the word movie in position I of our matrix. And this is exactly where the word embedding needs to be stored um, so that it matches with our corpus. This, this bit is important, so make sure you fully understand this function. I tried my best to explain it. I also put many comments in here to make very, very explicit what's going on. But this, this guy is important, so make sure you, you understand that. Right, and then um, I call my function, getting the, the weights, getting matri uh, get embedding matrix. I put in my, my tokenizer that knows everything about my target corpus. I put in the variable IMDB index, which is basically what I was loading from tutorial number 10, these pre-trained embeddings. I was calling them IMDB index. And I also specify the size of my vocabulary, which is 50, and that is the dimension of my resulting matrix there. So we created an embedding matrix of shape 2500, the words in our vocabulary, times 50, the embedding dimension of these words. And we encountered a, a large number of out of vocabulary words. That's not to worry you. The reason for this is that we will only consider the top 2,500 words, but in fact, this tokenizer object, it stores all the words or it stores information about all the words in our data. So this number um, is basically um, the rest of the words in our training of the unique words in our training set. Our training set has 23,916 plus 2,500 unique words. That is how to read that number. Or just ignore it if you're not concerned about it. You don't need to be concerned about it. And then um, within my matrix IMDB weights, I could now look for the index of some word, like the word film, which is another popular word. I think its index is three. And then I'll find the embedding weights of the word film in my matrix IMDB weights. And I should find the very same word in um, IMDB index is what I was loading from disk, the pre-trained embeddings from tutorial number 10. I can also ask V for the weights of the word film. And the result should be the same as above. And of course, that is a difficult comparison. But we can eyeball the results. And if we eyeball the results, let me try to Right. So here, for instance, 58117, 58117, 50318, 50318, minus 175, minus 175. Looks good. 
Um, that should work as well. And it should give us an array of all zeros, and it does, so you can convince yourself that these two embeddings are the same. We pulled our pre-trained embeddings that we were loading from disk and inserted them in the right position in our embedding matrix. IMDB weights. Now let's see what we do with IMDB weights. Now we have trust in our model. Well, essentially, we don't do that much with it. That line here is the key line. Well, before, before let me let me quickly run this code and the next one. Um, so that Kulab already trains these models. Um, that's the key thing here. And that is different from the previous model. We explicitly initialize our weights. And in the basic model, in our first model, I need to scroll a little bit. I can't avoid that. I have this wonderful table of content, but uh, if I don't know where to scroll, it doesn't work. This is the bit. Our first model had a this embedding layer, input dimension, output dimension, input length. We did not specify anything else. And, um, well, you could go to the Colab documentation to know about or to learn about, oh, sorry, all the, the other arguments that you can specify here. Embedding weights are initialized by default. By uniform weights, it's a bit hard to see, and I now I must not use my mice. But if you know that that embedding, uh, embedding initializer, initializer colon or well, this this uniform. So by default, the embedding weights are initialized randomly using a uniform distribution. That is what happened in model number one. And then we train these weights. But in model number two, we override this default behavior. Specify our embedding initializer. And basically, we are using that's another collab layer constant. Well, well, that's just the syntax. Don't worry about the syntax too much. We put in our IMDB weights this matrix that we created so carefully with our helper functions where we know for sure that the right pre-trained embedding for words like film and movie and the other words are in the right row of that matrix. And if we look up a row from that matrix, the correct embedding will be pulled out and forwarded to the next layer. That is how we can work with pre-trained embeddings. And one more thing to note, I'm using another new argument, trainable, and I'm setting that to false. Keras allows you to, to govern which of the weights in your neural network you want to train and which weights you want to keep frozen, keep fixed. And we will not train that. So we're using the pre-trained embedding as is. We're using these word to vet embeddings as is and train only the other weights in our neural network. Looking at our model, we still have this big embedding layer of the same dimensionality as before. And we still have our GRU layer with 16 units. And you see that um, although we have many weights in our neural network in total, the number of trainable weights is actually quite low. So we would expect that this model trains faster than the previous one because it, there are uh, far fewer weights to train. And fewer weights to train mean we don't need to bother with backpropagating gradients to update these weights. And indeed, that was pretty quick. 
here's my my code to calculate the accuracy also save the model to disk test accuracy 81 percent and the plot again not very insightful with just four epochs we'll see the the final results later on for models that were seriously trained okay so uh interim conclusion now you know how to work with pre-trained embeddings in keras which is pretty remarkable um and what we did is we have used pre-trained embeddings that we created ourselves using the word to vec algorithm using um, continuous back of words and negative sampling that is what we did in tutorial number 10 and there is there is clearly is hope to believe that this model number two should do better than model number one because of using this embedding weights that have been carefully pre-trained using word to vec and are not only obtained as part of the training, as was the case in model number one. These models, the, the, the chain of models, um, I, I put quite some effort into it. It's fairly well structured and systematic. I know self-praise is no praise, but um, try to really understand this stack of models. Model number one, random embedding. Model number two, pre-trained embedding. using the same corpus. We did the pre-training on our target corpus using word to vec in tutorial number 10. That is model number two. In model number one, all the embeddings were trained as part of fitting the model. And the key difference is that in model number one, we fit the model to minimize the binary cross entropy loss because we are working with a binary classification problem that's our goal and this goal has a large effect on our network training and therefore also on the embedding weights and in contrary to that model two uses these pre-trained embeddings that were trained to minimize the word to vec loss to to minimize the the loss function in SIBO with negative sampling that was also a binary classification task because we used negative sampling but that task was not to predict something like the sentiment that task was to predict whether a given a target word and one other word that other word was part of the context window of the target word or not. What I'm trying to say is that the embeddings that we used in model number two were trained for a completely different, were pre-trained for a different type of problem. And that problem was geared toward natural language and understanding natural language was geared toward recognizing words that commonly occur in the same context. And therefore, we would hope that the pre-trained embeddings carry more information about the, the structure of the wording of the language, the type of the language in the re review data set. They should. And then we would hope that because of that, they do better for sentiment analysis. This might be wrong. It's a hope that we have. It is an assumption that we make. We might find that is wrong. We might. Um, it depends very much on your task whether using pre-trained embeddings is the best way forward. What I really, really, really want to achieve is that you understand the difference between these models. Also because we don't train them long enough um, and apply some shortcuts to not get great results in the end. So the empirical results will never tell you the full story. They are affected by all the simplifications that we just need to make in the scope of a tutorial. And it's all the more important, therefore, to fully understand what these models are to, to illustrate. Model number three, well, the model is not dramatically important. It's the same as model number two with a two 
um, changes. The main change, well, or maybe the two changes are of equal importance, I don't know. One change is that I'm once more using the pre-trained um, IMDB embeddings. I'm using the same pre-trained embeddings, the tutorial 10 embeddings in my neural network. Um, sorry, let me let me run it and then I'll explain it. But now I'm setting the argument trainable to true. Very tiny change. The code is almost indistinguishable for model number three and model number two, but the consequences are maybe far reaching. At least conceptually, they are far reaching. Now I'm using pre trained VertuVec embeddings as part of my model, but I don't freeze them. And I will update them as part of the training. That's that's an interesting concept. I'm not sure how far you are in the in the lecture. Ideally, you would have completed the NLP part of the lecture by going into this tutorial. Hmm. Maybe it would have been a good idea to say that earlier. Um, sorry. In case you have completed the NLP part of the lecture, you might remember this model Ulfit. It uh, it was discussed in the scope of the last NLP session on state of the art type of models. And um, yeah, make this connection if you can, um, i.e., if you have already completed the the uh, corresponding lecture. We allow our sentiment classifier to adjust the embedding weights. So now we hope that the embedding weights bring into our model all this valuable information about the language and the semantic patterns in language and the relationship between words and the meaning king minus queen, no, king minus man plus woman, you know what I'm talking about, right? But we don't read them. We allow our network to adjust them so that they even better fit our target task sentiment analysis. That is, in my opinion, the most sensible architecture. And um, I can't guarantee that it gives us the best result, but conceptually, that makes the most of sense because um, it is um, something in between the two extremes of model number one training the embeddings entirely on the target corpus in the target task and model two not training the pre-trained embeddings at all. Here we have a middle way basically and use the pre-trained embedding but adjust them as part of the training. That is the one change and another change that's just a shortcut and because I wanted to show you the code since we built another GRU and since our GRU has the same same shape as the previous ones, I can pull out the final weights of model number two. So model number two layers one, that is the GRU layer, get weights. I'm pulling out the trained weights of the GRU layer. And I'm using these weights to initialize oops, my GRU. That should give model three another advantage in that the weights from which we start the training, they should be pretty good. These are the final weights from model two. We've trained them for four epochs. So they should be a lot better than starting from uh, randomly initialized weights. Well, on the one hand, I wanted to show you the code. Um, on the other hand, I'm in terms of comparing model two and model three, I'm cheating a little bit. I would not get a clear result on the net effect of allowing the embedding weights to be adjusted because I'm also adjusting here or I'm, I'm using the, the weights. Okay, um, model was trained. Now we have. Um, we need to, or we can, and need to train all the parameters. So training that model is more costly 
than training model number two because the embedding layer is unfrozen, is not fixed anymore. That's maybe the disadvantage. Um, that is just the standard fitting code using also my my diag model function and dumping everything to my score back and saving the model to disk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, and after elaborating so much on the difference between model three and model two, it's very disappointing to see that it's almost the same. Um, but that is really because I'm shortcutting the training. Let's see how how it goes in the end. Okay, um, time is running up. Um, I have I have more models. I have model four and model five. But um, oh, um, before elaborating on them, let me. There is some costly code to be re. Oh no, that's I I try the real one. Model. Uh, blah, blah, one, two, three, four and five mimic um, the previous two models. I continue using pre-trained embeddings. And in in one of the two models to come, I will freeze these embeddings during training. And in the other model to come, I will allow adjusting the pre-trained embeddings as part of the training. Um, one second, bear with me. I want to kick off the computations to save some time. Okay. Now, what is what's going on in this code? Model four. The difference is that now we use a different type of pre-trained embeddings. We no longer use the verb to back embeddings from tutorial number two, the ones we created ourselves using Gensim with our rather constrained computational resources. Instead, I was downloading from the internet uh, a data set with pre-trained embeddings. Um, I'm using Gluvi instead of word to vec And I was cautioned that I shouldn't and that students might get confused about me switching from word to vec to Gluvi. But I trust I trust in your ability to not get confused. Remember the lecture. We have Gluvi and word to vec I mean, personally, this is a little bit like um, comparing a Mercedes car to a BMW car. Maybe you like the Mercedes a little better, or maybe you like the BMW a little better, but, uh, well, personally, I would be pretty happy with either one. Um, and I think it's fair to say that either one is a pretty good car. Yeah, and it's a bit like that with these two types of embeddings. I believe, I seem to sense a slight preference for Gluvi in certain tasks over word to vec but it's two alternatives. You can use both. Use whichever you like better. Um, I used Gluvi. You can download the embedding from this link. They are pretty big. So ready yourself for downloading some gigabytes. And then the smallest version that you can download has an embedding dimension of 50. There are multiple embedding versions available. They differ in the dimension. They differ in terms of on which data they were pre-trained. Mine were pre-trained on Wikipedia data. It does make sense to check carefully which one you want to use. Um, of course, I didn't for that tutorial, but if you really are working on a real problem, then it makes sense to check or and to try and find a pre-trained embedding that comes from a corpus that shares some characteristics. Wikipedia is often used. Other embeddings are trained on used data. What type of data is better for, for your task? We are doing sentiment analysis of movie reviews. Is it better to use news type of language or Wikipedia type of language for pre-training? Well, hard to tell. 
Um, anyway, it's just, just saying in practice, it makes sense to spend a little time on checking and thinking what might be a good data set or a good pre-trained embedding. We use these Groovy embeddings here. Um, I have saved them to disk. I'm loading them from disk. Here's a little snippet of code to load them. That's essentially a text file. Every line in that text file has many numbers and one word at the first position of the line, just as the word to vec embedding text file I'll show you in tutorial number 10. And then we are reading that file line by line. And then we create our embedding matrix using the utility function that is part of this notebook, the one I was elaborating on earlier, get embedding matrix. And, you know, this bit really gave me a hard time when running it on my computer. Because these groovy embeddings, they are, they are quite, quite big. And um, in the file I'm using, there are 400,000 word vectors, and we are going through that file, and, and somehow that gave my computer a hard time. And, um, well, it just worked, worked like a charm on, on call-up, but I always had memory issues when running that code on my computer. So be warned that um, you might overwhelm your PC when, when running that. Okay, um, and, and then, well, now we initialize our embedding layer. Now we're building a new network, and this is exactly as model number two. Embedding layer, same configuration, just that we initialize the weights using now our Gluvy weights. That's the key bit here. Gluvy weights. It's the weights that we create using our get embedding matrix function from the Gluvy index that we were loading from disk before downloading it from Stanford's website. Okay, so different version of the embeddings, not trainable. By the way, um, I left these comments in here. If you want to play with these neural networks, feel free to do so. I would guess that you can improve them a little bit by adding dropout layers but um, I didn't bother with that in this example. Okay, uh, that's really it. Training, since we freeze the embedding weights, the number of parameters is pretty small. Here we fit the model, it's M4, we dump it into our score bag. Results are again the same, but it's really because of the, the data that I'm using here. Um, that the results are so boring. Um, one more, one more model, or well, in fact, two more models. Very briefly, model five is exactly um, as before. We we'll keep using Groovy embeddings, just that we allow our neural network to adjust these Groovy embeddings by setting trainable to true. And we are also pulling out the GRU weights from the previous model in order to kick off the training of the GRU from hopefully good weights. That is model number five. So comparing model two to three and four to five should get us an idea what is the, the merit of adjusting pre-trained weights as opposed to not adjusting them, as not adjusting them is bound to be cheaper in terms of computational time. That's sort of the, the notion of this comparison. Still training, but should be done very soon. Yeah, here we go. Getting a little bit worried that there might be something wrong with my code um, because the test set accuracy is always the same. That's certainly uh, not a good result, or that's suspicious. Anyways, one last model, and then we are done. Um, I keep using Gluvy. 
everything is as before, just that I don't allow to train my, uh, my weights. And um, well, in this, this last Keras example for language or NLP type of models, I wanted to show you how easy it is to use bidirectional models. Again, let me kick off the computations so that we can talk while the code is running. I could imagine that when you were following the lecture that these bidirectional LSTMs or, or recurrent neural networks sounded something super sophisticated and extremely complicated. And um, therefore, I just wanted to demonstrate in, in practice that might not be the case. With Keras, it's really easy to build bidirectional models. We just import the corresponding layer. And then I have my model here, embedding layer as before, same as before. And then I use a bidirectional layer and then put a GRU layer in my bidirectional layer, specifying how the forward and the backward GRU are going to be merged. From averaging mechanism, I just concat them, thereby enlarging the hint space, which should be 32 then. And, and that's it, really. That, that's it. All the rest stays the same. All the, the, the remaining code is just copy pasted from above. So bidirectionality is easily available to us. Much more important is to think whether you can really afford training a bidirectional model. Uh, that is to say, would your task grant you access to the full text before you need to make a prediction. In sentiment analysis, that is the case. We are given one review, we are asked to predict the sentiment, we have the full text available, so we can scan that text from left to right and right to left, that's fine. In language modeling, that would not be possible because if we predict the next word in a sequence, then the right context is not available to us. But for sentiment analysis, that's okay. We can check whether a bidirectional model um, works. Okay, trained. Again, this suspicious test set accuracy. Probably need to investigate that. And then we are done. Um, so I put a little conclusions section in here. All your models should be in this score back, all but the logit model, maybe. So we can also add the logit model and then put everything into a data frame, and then we should be able to compare the models. It's um, unfortunately futile to do it with these models because they were trained with many simplifications and only on the very short and sampled data frame. But um, let me... Let me check. So I'm switching to another tutorial. Um, well, let me go into daylight mode. Well, we do have the final result of these models when running them on the full data set, no sampling for 25 epochs. And um, and well, you do note that differences in accuracy remain very marginal. That's apparent from these block uh, bar plots in terms of the loss, the binary cross entropy loss, there are some large differences. Um, on the other hand, binary cross entropy loss is probably not the measures you care about the most in your application. So in terms of classification accuracy, even when training the models with a reasonable amount of time, for a reasonable amount of time, the differences are rather marginal. Um, do I have access? Yeah. We also see that here. Um, 
accurate fee M1, sorry, sorry for, for going Germanic, M1, M1, very poor. Model M1, 85% um, tested accuracy, nice, and um, that was a bit like the logit model, right? What was the score of the logit model? Remind me, I should have it here available, score. Logistic regression. Oh, uh, now on the on the full data set, logit is also a little stronger. So the logit benchmark is 87 or 88, let's say. Ah, ah, I wish I had not run that code. Okay. Um. Well, you you do see these things. M2 is better than M1, which makes sense. I, well, I like that result. In M2, we use embeddings and don't, we use pre-trained embeddings that should give us a little edge. So a good that M2 improves over M1. In M3, we allow our model to adjust the weights of these embeddings and that hurts. Interesting. Um, many more parameters. So maybe since both models trained for 25 epochs, that model M3 would have needed more training in order to adjust all these additional parameters. Uh, however, um, results from comparing M4 to M5 do not quite confirm that. M4 uses Gluvi and performs a little worse than M2. Although Gluvi embeddings will be much more powerful than our own embeddings in general. Our own embeddings come from our own corpus. Maybe this is why M2 is better than M4. However, M5, starting from groovy embeddings and then adjusting them, gives the overall best result here in this comparison. Nice. Um, I kind of like that result in, in that we certainly have trust in groovy, but when using groovy, these embeddings come from a different corpus. So not adjusting them and just using them from this different corpus as we do in M4 does not work so well. In fact, less good than using our own pre-trained embeddings. But if we allow to adjust the groovy weights, then our model starts to shine. That is a nice result. The bidirectional model did not work out. Maybe this is an issue with the training. I should be able to see the, the plots as well. That's model number six, the bidirectional one. Hmm. Judging by the validation set performance, there is a little evidence that we should continue training that model. Here we have model number five, which was Gluvi with weight, embedding weight adjustment. The training plot looks pretty good, but the validation accuracy looks a little bit worrisome. It decreases. Not sure why that is the case. We should investigate that. Maybe early stopping is something to consider here. That is Gluvi embeddings without adjusting the embedding weights. So just training the GRU weights. And that is a nice curve. We could speculate whether some more training would further raise accuracy. Let me check something. It seems that it seems that um, any time we allow adjustment of the embedding weights, our plot looks a little bit uh, worrisome. Let's confirm that. 
Uh, model 3, yeah, yeah, you see, no support for that. Model 3 is also one, our own pre-trained embedding, but with adjustment. I haven't seen the plots before. Uh, it's all freshly baked, so um, sorry for getting a little bit over exciting uh, here, but um, that, that's nice. Um, again, this rather odd shape of the development of the validation loss while the training performance looks okay. Training the model doesn't really help in terms of validation cell performance. When we allow an adjustment of the pre-trained embedding weights. Okay, model number two. There again, things are okay. That bump here is a little bit suspicious, but uh, looks more like an artifact. Really, and now it will be interesting to look at model number one. Model number one did not use any embeddings. If that also displays this odd shape of the validation set performance, then maybe it is the fact that we lack a sufficient amount of data to train all these parameters. Or if the validation set performance looks better, then maybe it's really this adjustment of the pre-trained weights that causes us some problems. Let's check. Ah, and here we go. So that offers a new perspective. Examining model one, we also see this pattern of the validation set performance almost remaining constant, maybe after a very humble jump upwards in the early part. So in sum, we found some evidence here, strong evidence or fair evidence at least, that when we make these very big neural networks with the many parameters, if we, whenever we adjust the embedding weights, either because we don't use pre-trained weights at all, or because we use pre-trained weights but allow to train them, Whenever we do that, we get this odd shape of the validation set performance. So um, I suspect that we just lack a sufficient amount of data to tune all these weights. That is something we would then need to work on. First of all, we need to work on uh, confirming this hypothesis. And if that hypothesis can be confirmed, then we well, need to decide uh, what to do about it. Maybe we can gather more data in practice. That might be a viable approach. Or we just might have to live with the fact that we can't use networks with too many parameters. Or um, what we, we could and probably should try is if these many parameters are a problem, too many degrees of freedoms, maybe we should try to regularize our neural networks and uh, introduce dropout. Likewise, we can play with weight decay and uh, early stopping, which are yet other approaches toward regularization. That's probably a good idea. Anyways, anyways, I've kept you busy for too long. Again, thank you very much for your patience and staying with me. And I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. It will be, or it actually was, our last tutorial on the topic of NLP. We'll move on with some more tutorials concerning convolutional neural networks, the last type of neural networks that we have covered in the course. So <sighs> the, there is a light at the end of the tunnel or the end is near or whatever phrase you might find appropriate at this moment. Anyways, that was the NLP part. I hope you liked it and I look very much forward to seeing you in a future tutorial. Thank you very much. Take care and bye bye.